You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life changing, life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. Hallelujah. So the book of Ephesians, I want to begin to read. Let me just read uh, chapter one, maybe from verse one down to verse number six. And then let me just say a few things. Today, I'm going to be teaching about settling the struggle of identity. Settling the struggle of identity. Put your hands on yourself and say, I know who I am. I, I want us to be clear. See, Satan oftentimes attacks us at this place of identity. I love how Paul addresses this to the church of Ephesus. And so, and really, you know, this is really written to many churches in Asia, not just to the church at Ephesus. One of the ways that the, the pastoral epistle of Ephesians differs than some of Paul's other writings is that he's really directing his writing not to a specific problem in the church, but he's directing it in a practical way. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment to several of the churches that are in Asia Minor. And so Paul pens this. He's, he's in prison at the time of, of his writing this. And in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse number 1, it reads, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Oh, I love it. Come on, let, let, let's feel this together for a moment. Um, this is about settling the struggle of identity. It's about not letting man, not letting Satan, not letting people get in my head to try to convince me that I'm someone different other than who God says I am in Jesus. And so we're going to settle this struggle with identity today. Get, get some of the language of the book of Ephesians in your spirit. Everybody say riches. Everybody say grace. Shout glory. Shout filled. Shout fullness. In Christ. In him. When you start and I start studying the book of Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, uh, five times the word riches is mentioned. Uh, Twelve times grace is mentioned. Uh, eight times glory is mentioned. Uh, uh, six times fullness or filled is mentioned. The, the, some 12 times the idea of in him, whether it is with him or through him or in him is mentioned. Here it is. In the nutshell, the book of Ephesians is about riches and fullness in Christ. It, it is about how we maximize both a, a horizontal relationship with one another and a vertical relationship with our Lord Jesus. And, and, and I want you to understand the power of this because I'm about to make a really strong statement, a strong claim. And, and the strong statement, a strong claim is that this just might be the most contemporary book in the Bible. Pastor Galia, what, what do you mean the most contemporary book in the Bible? Uh, understand something. The Apostle Paul is proclaiming here in Ephesians, he's proclaiming God's order. Now watch this. He's proclaiming God's order in a post-Augustine Roman era. Right. A, a controversial moment. Watch this. He is writing this. At, and and y'all, this this series was put in my spirit before 
the insurrection on Capitol Hill a few days ago. Um, it was put in my spirit before then. But, but this is being written at a time of social disintegration. It, it is written at a time where, where the community and society is falling apart. And this is the word from the Lord. The word from the Lord for those of us who are believers, and I hope you can receive it. If you don't just receive it for our society, receive it for your house. Receive it for your church. What Paul is writing to us today in this contemporary book, the book of Ephesians, is that we serve a God that we have so much riches in, so much fullness in, that this God promises community in a world of disunity. I'm going to say it again. Community in a world of disunity. That this God promises reconciliation in places of alienation. I'm going to speak that over somebody's family. Reconciliation in a place of alienation. Wouldn't that be a great 2021? As a matter of fact, I'm going to decree and declare that for somebody. That where there was once alienation. Does anybody receive this? Where there was once alienation, God is going to bring about reconciliation. God is saying in my kingdom, as I am operating because of the fullness and the riches that you have in Christ Jesus, there does not need to be war. There will be peace. Now, now let me say a few things by way of introduction, y'all. The first thing that I want to set up to introduce this book to us is, and, and this is in your note sheets, uh, Roman number one introduction, letter A. And if you're wondering where I'm, I'm teaching from, I'm in my office. So welcome to my office. Um, here's the first thing. The book of Ephesians answers the questions. That blank is questions. Everybody say questions. It answers two questions. The first question the book of Ephesians raises is, what does it mean to be in Christ? Great word. What does it mean to be in Christ? The second question that the book of Ephesians answers is, what then does that demand of me? If I'm in Christ, do I get to talk like that? If I'm in Christ, do I get to function like this? In other words, the book of Ephesians is about, watch this, role, relationship, and responsibility. Role, relationship, responsibility. It is about understanding what my role is. It is about understanding that as a result of that role, that there are certain relationships I need to have. And it's about understanding that in that role and within those relationships, there's responsibility. I'm parking here for just a moment as I teach this, because I think too often times because we don't recognize that we're in Christ, we want roles, but we don't want responsibilities. Teach Pastor Gallier. We want relationships, but we don't want responsibilities. What Paul does here at the church of Ephesus to the church of Ephesus and these other churches in Asia Minor is that he's saying to them, because you have been blessed with peace from God, our father, because grace has been smiled upon you, because you have been given every possible riches and fullness in Christ, you have a responsibility as a result of this relationship. And, and as I teach this, these next six, seven, eight, I don't know how many months it's going to be. As I teach through this, I want us to hold on to this. That I want to say it again for, for, for my folks sitting in the back. If I have a role, then I have a corresponding responsibility. If I'm in a relationship, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a parent, my young people that are listening. If you have a relationship, if you're a daughter, if you're a son, then that means you have responsibilities. And you have responsibilities because you have a role in the family. And I think oftentimes what we're learning here as we're going to start unpacking the book of Ephesians is that I get in spiritual trouble. Pastor, how do you get in spiritual trouble? We get in spiritual trouble. Spiritual trouble arises from our failure to remember that we are citizens in two kingdoms. Because I want you to understand this. He, he, he says, he says, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints, watch this, look at the two kingdoms, or I say two kingdoms, here are the two kingdoms, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ. 
Did you, did you catch two kingdoms? Kingdom one in Ephesus. Kingdom two in Christ Jesus. No different in 2021. I'm in Rocky Mount and I'm in Christ. I'm in Wilson and in Christ. I'm in Atlanta and in Christ. I'm in Philadelphia and in Christ. Now watch this. And so I get in spiritual trouble where I have this tendency to pursue Christ in Christ, but withdraw from the world, acting like I'm not also in Ephesus. Or I become so preoccupied, teach pastor, I become so preoccupied with the world in Ephesus that I forget that I'm also in Christ. The key to what happens here in the book of Ephesians is that he is teaching us, come on, put your hands on yourself, say, I need to know how to live in two kingdoms. How do I live in Rocky Mount and in Christ? I, I go through this as a state legislator. How, how do I work in politics, but in Christ? How, how do I function in two kingdoms? Everybody say two kingdoms. And this is important because I want us to see the value of what we're going to learn. We get, don't y'all look at me with that attitude. You know, you know folk who are at work and act like they don't know how to be in Christ also. Come on, hello, come, can I come get you? you? You know folk who act like they are not in two kingdoms. And you also know, I know them super spiritual folk who act like all I am is in Christ. And I act like I'm not also in Walmart. I'm acting like I'm also not in school. What Paul is teaching us here in the book of Ephesians, it's the most contemporary book in the Bible, in my opinion. He is teaching us how to live in two kingdoms. And we need to learn that because I'm about up to here with pseudo saints that is always hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Everything is so over the top, spiritual, over the top. Everything, everything is just all deep and the Greek and the Hebrew and speaking in tongues and it's all this and all that. And you forget, Joker, you in Rocky Mount. And I'm also about up to here with Christians who don't know how to be in Christ because I happen to also be in Rocky Mount. This is what Paul is going to unpack for us. Is that making sense? If that's making sense, type it in. That's making sense. Now, that's a perfect segue into this second point of our introduction which means I want you to jot this down. There is power in the practical. There is power in the practical. What Paul is doing here is Paul is communicating basic Christian truths. Paul is communicating. And let me say, this is really the appeal, if you will, of the book of Ephesians. The appeal of the book of Ephesians is that it represents the basic doctrines of Christianity. I think I may have counted like 27 different doctrines that we're going to study in just these few chapters. I mean, Ephesians is only six chapters, and in six chapters, it's like 27 doctrines taught. What the appeal of the book of Ephesians is, is that Paul takes the doctrines of Christianity and he explains them clearly, but watch this, practically. See, we miss the fact that the real power is in us practically living out Christianity. I think oftentimes people feel like I have to be this like over the top. My God, I mean, I have to have all of these deep answers to everything. Let me tell you the power of Christianity is in the practical living of it. it there is power. I feel you, God. There is power in your devotion life, the practical experience of my, my, my living out the faith. There's power in my prayers. There is power in my meditation. There is power in getting rest. There is power in my disciplined study of the word. There is power in my taking care of my temple. There is power in practical things. And Paul is going to teach us in these six chapters where the power in these practical things lie. Let me say a few things about the practical side of this. This is not in your notes that I presented to my media team, but let me just try to make this thing live a little bit. The first, the first area where this is practical is that as we study the book of Ephesians, Ephesians, jot these down. I'm going to give you three. 
Ephesians is first of all intercession. It is intercession. Prayer. Um, I think more than any other New Testament epistle, it has the character and the form of prayer. Let me tell you why this is important. Because when we argue with folk, we may or may not persuade them. But when we pray for people, it changes the dynamic of the relationship. I'm about to speak something over you. I'm giving you the overall understanding of the book of Ephesians. It is literally an epistle that has the character and the form of prayer. Let me say it again. The character and the form of prayer. In other words, Ephesians is intercession. Pastor, what are you saying from a practical lens? What I'm saying from a practical lens is 2021, I'm not fighting with you. I'm not arguing with you. I am praying for you. Can you imagine what it would do if we would shift the whole conversation that instead of arguing with somebody, trying to persuade them, trying to get them on our side, we make them in our mind to take on the form of intercession. Somebody jot it down. Somebody say it out. I'm just going to pray for you. So, so first of all, the practical element of this book is that it is, it is intercession. Now watch this. It is not just intercession. The form of, of the book of Ephesians is also affirmation. Everybody say affirmation. Now, now let me just give you a moment. Can I, can I teach for just a moment? Okay, thank you. Um, um, oftentimes when we look at how books of the Bible in various genres are kind of written out, there are different methods of persuasion. Um, sometimes you will find communication being what is called an apologetic, right? An apologetic is a reasoned argument. The whole point is to persuade. When you study and I study, even though, remember I told you like 27 different doctrines here, but they are not written in a form as an apologetic because Paul has the ability to do that. He, he can drill down and wear you out, right? But it's not reasoned argument. Now watch this. It is also not a polemic. P-O-L-E-M-I-C. It's not an apologetic, meaning a reasoned argument. But it is also not a polemic. It is not a verbal or a written attack. Okay? It is, it is not me coming after you. It is not me trying to argue with you about who I am. And it's not me coming at you. Watch this about who you're not. This is what Paul does in the book of Ephesians that I think we need to hold on to. This is going to settling the struggle with identity. Paul is saying, I'm not here to argue with you about who I am and who you are. I'm not here to reason with you about it. I'm here to affirm it. And can you imagine what it would look like in 2021 where we just draw the line in the sand and say, you know what? 2021, I'm not trying to create an apologetic and a reasoned argument about who I am in Christ. I'm not trying to create some type of verbal or written attack. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just jubilantly and boldly and matter of factly affirm who I am in God, who I am in Christ, who I am in the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you don't get it, if you don't understand it, if you don't like it, if you don't agree with it, if you don't want to support it, if you don't want to echo it, if you don't want to parrot it, whatever, I am going to affirm who I am in Christ. And this is what Paul does over and over again. As we study the book of Ephesians, he is making statements of affirmation. I want to speak this over your life. You need to know who you are if nobody else believes you. You need to know who you are if other people don't see it in you. You need to know who you are if other folk are going to argue that you're not. Folk will argue you about you. They will say you're not this, you're not that. Paul says, you know what? Time out for all this. I'm making a statement to all of those who are saints in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ. He says, you are in Christ Jesus. He's making an affirmation. The language of the book of Ephesians is a language of intercession. 2021, we need to be praying for folk. It is a statement of, of, of literally just me affirming who I am in Christ. And I want to affirm who you are in Christ. But watch this. The third thing is the book of Ephesians is also a book of evangelism. And what, you know, I've taught so many evangelism classes in my 20 years, 21 years of pastoral ministry. 
this year or Easter Sunday. It'll be 21 years. I've taught so many classes on evangelism in these 21 years. Let me tell you the best. When we talk about evangelism, rarely do people talk about the book of Ephesians from an evangelistic lens. The reason why I say it's a book of evangelism is because it is an example of what God does in people. You are a walking evangelistic testimony because you all have. Does anybody here who's listening to me teach today have a testimony about, look, I'm an example of what God does in people. And when people begin to look at you and they begin to say, what? God did that in you. God worked that out for you. So literally he shows us in the book of Ephesians how God works things out for people. And so it's a book of evangelism here. Here's my third point now for the introduction, because I just have three big teachings to give you. But let me get through the introduction because I want us in the introduction to kind of be thinking broadly about what the Lord is doing in the book of Ephesians. Here's the third thing. Now, this is where I get to because I know you're wondering. Pastor, when are you going to get to identity? I'm glad you asked. I'm, I'm at identity. Everybody say he's at identity. Okay. So here's a piece about identity. Our self-image is determined by what the person that we think the most of thinks about us. Whew. One more time. Our self-image is determined by what the person that we think the most of thinks about us. That's why we have to be careful, particularly as parents, that we're not running around saying negative things about our children. And because our children, deep down inside, they want to act like they don't care, but they care about what we think. And because of that, their self image is oftentimes determined by what we think. Now, this is important. Some of us are walking around in a less than. Everybody say less than. Some of us are walking around in a less than state. We're walking around in a less than state. My God, the Lord is going to heal in this word. We're walking around in a less than state because there are people that we want to see us differently than they really do. And because they don't see us as more, they made us feel less. Sis, bruh, I'm about to deliver you. I'm about to deal with that inner hurt. You cannot allow your self-image to be dictated by a person who is anyone other than Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, what really matters is how the Lord sees us. And I know that sounds like, oh, of course you would say that. But the truth of the matter is if you want to have, everybody say, inner healing. If we want to have inner healing in our life, then we have to discover how special we are to God. Woo, God. And so you want inner healing. You don't want to walk around feeling dumb. You don't want to walk around feeling unwanted. You don't want to walk around feeling unappreciated. You don't want to walk around feeling unattractive. You don't want to walk around feeling like you don't have value and feeling like you don't have significance. Let me speak it over your life. The way you get that inner healing in 2021 is focusing on how the Lord sees us. And the reality of it is the when, when I understand how God really sees me, it is going to heal me. Watch this. Not from the outside in, but from the inside out. See, a lot of folk will put, do all the trappings. You ever had, let me just let you know a little personal secret. And I think I'm not the only one in this. Have you ever had that moment where you're feeling kind of down and kind of, I don't know, just not your best. And you don't feel worthy. You don't feel accomplished. I, I have these feelings all the time. And a lot of times what I'll do when I'm feeling like that is that day I'll dress up. Like if I'm not feeling good inside, I'll try to dress up outside. Y'all, yes, no, I've done it, Pastor. I thought about doing it. I put a little extra makeup on. I did my hair different. And, you know, you, you know, all this changing and stuff we doing on the outside. Sometimes we are compensating for what's not happening on the inside. As I minister, this is why this is masterpiece in the making. That's what I'm teaching all next six months out of Ephesians. Masterpiece in the making. Matter of fact, put your hands on yourself. Say, I'm a masterpiece in the making. I'm a ma I want you to get this. I want you to marry. If you're married, I want you to say, my marriage is a masterpiece. If it doesn't feel like it, I'm telling you it's a masterpiece in the making. I want you to say it about your children. My children are masterpieces in the making. This is what Paul is doing for us. He is teaching us about inner healing by being concerned 
about what God says about us and how God sees us. Now, let me park here for just a moment, y'all. The reason this matters is because doing, get it, get it, doing comes from being. So being then has to always come before doing. This is, y'all, y'all, what makes it possible to live the Christian life, what makes it possible for performing the way God wants me to perform is by me actually being, being a Christian. I don't have to worry about constantly fixing the outside to make my inside feel better if I can heal inwardly and I understand who I am on the inside, it's going to automatically show up on the outside because that's how God works. God works from the inside out. We know this, right? So, so we'll never perform. We see too many Christians. I, I want to, maybe a few weeks ago, we talked about this. I want to minister this again. God is not pleased with our underperformance. You, and some of you, as you're listening to me teach today, you're underperforming. You're gifted, but you're not doing anything with it. You have ability and potential, but you're not doing anything with it. You, you, you might post about it. You might take a picture about it. But deep down inside, you're not really performing. And the reason you're not really performing at the level that God wants you to is because, and because we will never perform as God wants us to perform. Watch this until we know who we are. What's going to get you performing as a wife? is seeing yourself as a wife. It is when we are assured, what's going to make me perform as a father is seeing myself as a father. It, seeing myself as a husband. Seeing myself as a pastor. I'm not just a pastor from name on the outside. I feel that thing. I see myself that way. Because, because, because when we are sure of our person, our performance follows. When we are sure of our person, our performance follows. So I don't ever have to wonder about, well, I wonder if they'll accept my preaching. I wonder how they'll feel if I'm singing a solo. I wonder what they'll think about if I'm the one playing. The only reason why you are uncertain about your performance is because you are uncertain about your person. And the moment you become certain, I'm teaching right. Boy, I wish I could see comments right now. And the moment I become certain about my person, I'm going to become more certain about my performance. Y'all, y'all, and y'all, this is why if you ever notice you can you can change a person for a little while on the outside. You ever have you ever corrected somebody? And, you know, I have lots of staff or you discipline someone or rebuke somebody for some kind of work performance or something that goes on or maybe on your job you have been disciplined and or our children right we have to discipline our children from time to time and a lot of times what happens is that they'll change for a little while um, and they'll begin doing the right stuff I want you to get this they'll be doing the right stuff temporarily I want you to get this but they're doing it in their own energy because they've not really changed on the inside. Go back to my initial statement about roles, relationships, and responsibilities. If you're not living out your responsibility, I can tell you, right? You have to go do this. But until you see yourself in the role, until you see yourself in the relationship, you ultimately only can meter out those responsibilities in our own energy. And so this is why Oftentimes, Christians, you ever see them, they, man, they get all excited and they're doing all this work and they've been, they've been singing, they've been greeting, they've been teaching class, they've been doing all this, they've been all hype, but they've been doing it in their own energy. Because deep down inside, they don't really see themselves as it. They're just living it out in their own energy. The only way God, what Paul does in the book of Ephesians is that Paul is saying, I want you to really see who you are on the inside because the moment you see that it is going to have a lasting effect on what happens on the outside. I think too many of us have just listened to the devil because you do know he talks, right? I think too many of us listen to the devil and we've listened to his lies. We've listened to his lies about what we're chained to and we're listening to his lies about 
not being able to amount to anything. And we're listening to his lies about not being able to teach and not being able to preach and, and how I can't witness. And, and the devil has me convinced. And he's saying, y'all, that we're going to fail. So we have failed in our own minds and we never try to do the work for God. That's what I hope the spirit of God will change in 2021 as I teach through this masterpiece in the making series from the book of Ephesians. Let me say one or two more things to introduce this. I think this is letter D in your introductory notes. Letter D here is our doxology should be driven by our doctrine. Our doxology should be driven by our doctrine. Now we're going to see this. We're going to see the first few chapters are very doctrinal. Everybody say doctrine. Pastor, what is doctrine? Thank you for asking me. Doctrine is right thinking about God. Right thinking about God operating in a certain area. This is what Paul is teaching us in the book of Ephesians. He is teaching us. I want you to jot these three words down. Jot these three words down. Doctrine. Doxology. Duty. One more time. Doctrine, doxology, duty. Doctrine is right thinking about God. Doxology is the corresponding praise that wells up, that surfaces because of that right thinking. Watch it, get this, get this. Doctrine, right thinking about God. Doxology, the worship that builds up, overflows because of that doctrine. And then duty. My response to that doxology. Have you ever noticed that some of the people that have the most to say about God do the least for God? Think about that for a moment. All these folk with how good God has been, how great God is in, and God has made a way, and God has done this. You have all of this doxology, but no duty. And the reason I have a bunch of doxology and no duty is because my doxology is not based on doctrine. But doctrine, when I really get to thinking about who God, God, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm getting excited in my office here, but I want somebody to get this. When you and I begin thinking about, about who God is, what God has done, who he has made us. Let me stop. Let me say it one more time. You take a moment. Think about who God is. Think about what he's done for us. Think about what he's done for you. And then think about who he has made you. Look at who you are right now and remember who you were and respond and understand that it was because of God's nature and character that he made you into who you are. There's no way that can't lead to worship. See, I, I, I'm a little iffy. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm a little iffy on people that that don't have no shout. Because I don't know how. You think about who you were and then and see who you are now and it not lead to a praise. I, y'all, how can you come face to face with the truths of the Bible, face to faith, face to face with your own story of redemption? My God, put your hands on yourself. Say, I, I am a story of redemption. When you come face to face with your own redemption story, <laughs> oh God, I feel that. When you come face to face with your own redemption story, man, it moves your, it lifts your voice. It lifts your heart. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to set you up. It lifts your mind and it lifts your hands. As a matter of fact, it lifts your whole life. And so as we begin studying this, we start to see that Paul, as he writes the book of Ephesians, he spends a lot of time in doctrine to create a doxology so that we can respond with a duty. And I think some people claiming some stuff about Christ, but your duty is leaving you suspect. Or should I say your lack of duty is leaving us suspect. So what, how do I settle the struggle with my identity? Because I'm bigger than my race. I'm bigger than my community. I'm bigger than my job. I'm bigger than my checking account. I'm bigger than how much I make on the job. I'm bigger than my occupational title. I'm in Christ, but I'm in two kingdoms because I'm also in Rocky Mount. 
How do I struggle? How do I settle the struggle with identity? Paul, in these first six verses, teaches us three things that I want to I ask you to think about. Here's the first one. The first thing that Paul teaches us here is I need to recognize, everybody say recognize, I need to recognize my righteousness. It's right there in verse one. I need to recognize my righteousness. Look at his righteousness. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. To the saints, everybody say saints. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, now, now let me... First of all, let me go ahead and kill this demon. This is a rough word now. Paul is saying not so much who I am, but how I became who I am. This is reckoned. The, the way I the reason I got here, look at what he says. Everybody say, by the will of God. By the will of God. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm a saint. Because of the will of God, I think what can really humble us if we get more focused, not on who I am, but how I became who I am. The way I became a saint was by the will of God. The way I got to this point was by the will of God. What does he say here? He is saying he is saying that it, it, that we are saints, meaning and we are faithful in Christ, meaning we're supposed to be serving. Remember, it's at the will of God. We should be serving others. We should be serving in another's name because it's the will of God. We should be serving someone else's interest because it's the will of God. We should be serving at someone else's pleasure. The Lord I'm talking about because of the will of God. Recognize our righteousness. It is not anything we have done. It is who God has made us. Y'all, the will of God's calling, jot this down. The will of God's calling is salvation and service. That's a mouthful. The will of God's calling, say that with me. The will of God's calling is salvation and service. You don't believe me? Look at what Paul says. He says to the saints who are in Ephesus, watch this, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. I would argue that some of us are claiming sainthood, but we're not faithful. Some of us, some of us are not faithful in Christ Jesus. I want to, I want to work through this for a minute. So what is the point? Here's the sub point to this sub point to this issue of recognizing my righteousness is that I must have the right concept of who I am. I must have the right concept of who I am to the saints. Everybody say, I'm a saint. If you're saved, you get to say it. Everybody say, I'm a saint. Come on. I'm a saint. But can you also say, I'm also faithful in Christ Jesus? A whole bunch of us are claiming saint, and we may be if we're saved, but we should also be faithful in Christ Jesus. So the word saint is describing my standing before the Lord. The saint. This is my position. This is the issue of recognizing where my righteousness comes from. So I'm in the right standing before the Lord. I want you to see this. But the word faithful is describing my activities in the world. What a, what a tragedy to have the right standing before the Lord, but not the right activities before the world. And the reason is because I don't realize I keep forgetting I live in two kingdoms. Can, can I throw this out? And this is something I I, I, don't, I won't say I, I struggle with because I don't think I struggle with it. Um, I think I just have to keep reminding myself. And I want to remind you. Your social media posts should indicate that you understand you live in two kingdoms. I think sometimes that's not our testimony. You know, I I posted, you know, me at the shooting range. I'm sure some people got offended because, you know, here's this pastor, you know, with his Glock. 
I live in I live in Rocky Mount. I live in two worlds. I live in two kingdoms. You know, I, I'm in Christ, which means I'm not gonna do anything illegal, but I'm in Rocky Mount, which means I need to protect myself and my family. I live in two kingdoms. We have to recognize that saint is describing my standing before God, but the faithful that Paul says is describing my activity in the world. And we have to recognize that because we live in two kingdoms, it's not just enough to have right standing before God. I have to also have faithfulness in terms of my activities in the world. So, so the life, the ministry, now this is important. The life Paul is describing, y'all, you know, I'm going to take my time. I have no reason for me to rush through these books. I'm not going anywhere. I hope y'all aren't going anywhere. The life, the ministry, and the title that Paul is stating, he says, apostle of Christ Jesus and the saints who are in Ephesus. The life, the ministry, and the title was not something he claimed for himself. Nor was it something the church bestowed upon him. I'm going to say it one more time. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, everybody say, by the will of God. That means I am who I am because of the sovereign work and the sovereign will of God. I think too often times, oh God, I feel this thing. I think too often times we are claiming that of ourselves that God never said about us. We are making statements about ourselves that God has never made about us. That we are claiming that we're a saint. We're claiming we're faithful. We're claiming we are this or that. We're claiming to be a leader. We're claiming to be elevated. We're claiming to be whatever we're claiming to be. And yet it has never been, God never said it, right? Paul is saying what is said of me is not, be and I think the church is guilty of this. And, I'm, and I don't speak, of Word Tabernacle exclusively, I think the church universally is guilty of this. We bestow titles upon people that God never claimed. You know, so we make people this or that in the ministry because they give a lot of money or they give a lot of time. And what Paul is saying is our testimony ought be that the life and the ministry and the title that is attached to us is not something we claim for ourselves and it's not something the church bestowed upon us. It has only been given to me by the work and the will of God. You know, I didn't go. I was watching a TV show. Uh, I forget the name of it now. I was actually enjoying the show until they dissed the church. And then I was just like, so here we go. Um, you know, so the guy was like, man, I want you to marry me, whatever. He said, I'm not a minister. He said, oh, it's no big deal. You can just go online. You can just go online. And get your, you know, license to be a minister, you know, whatever. Next thing you know, this guy's preaching funerals and doing weddings. And it is stuff that he bestowed upon himself. We have to be really careful that I'm not bestowing stuff upon myself. That whatever we are should be as a result of the sovereign work and the sovereign will of God. I'm, I'm, I'm already out of time. So when, when... Paul speaks about our being saints. The word that he uses is set apart. That's what that word saint means. It means separated. Watch this. I've been set apart. I've been separated for the purpose of God. This is going to help me clean up my identity. I'm, my identity is cleaned up when I recognize where my righteousness comes from. And, and so this is important. Everybody say, I'm in Christ. I want you to see that. He says, faithful in Christ Jesus. God is able to look at you and see you as a person who has absolutely no fault. He sees you as perfect. He sees you as holy. God sees you as blameless. Look at all that stuff people talking about. You unworthy. The devil is a liar and so are they. God sees me as worthy because I'm in Christ. Let me tell you what humility is. Humility is recognizing who we are in Jesus Christ. Just to be to be humble does not mean I have to be humiliated. And a whole bunch of us are walking around with a chip on our shoulder because of how people have identified us and how people have, have seen us and how people are labeling us and how people are calling us. And God is saying, you are a saint in Christ Jesus. I'm a saint in Christ Jesus. I'm almost done teaching 
the beginning part. I'm going to have to bring this sheet back next week. Let me help you understand something real quick. We know how to believe. We know how to accept other things that God says about us. And, and so when God says I'm a sinner, you accept that, don't you? When God says Christ died on the cross to pay the price for your sins, you accept that, don't you? And we should accept it. When God says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, you accept that, don't you? When, when now that God says you are a saint, now that God says you are a child of God, now that God says you are in Jesus Christ, put your hands on yourself and say, I accept that. You need to accept that. I'm closing on this illustration real quick and we'll be done. I was... You know, I like to read, right? I read all kinds of stuff. I don't read just theological stuff or doctrinal stuff or whatever. I was reading about nature, the animal creation. And um, I was reading about ducks. It just happened to be ducks, right? And they were talking about how ducks have a higher propensity to attaching themselves to the very first things they see. Um, and normally when they hatch, that's not a problem because the first thing they see is a mama duck. Right. So they just kind of mimic. They kind of follow the mama duck. The problem is when they're hatched and the mama duck is not around and there's another animal around, a dog, particularly a dog, cat, something like that. And inevitably, they experience something called imprinting. Everybody say imprinting. They experience something called imprinting. Now, let me tell you, let me I, I have a definition here for you. Imprinting is a rapid learning process that takes place early in the life of a social animal and establishes a behavior pattern as rec recognition of an attraction to its own kind. Watch this or a substitute. Very important. A rapid learning process that takes place early in the life to establish my behavior pattern as a recognition of an attraction to its own kind or a substitute. I think our problem perhaps as Christians is we have allowed imprinting to happen. I have, I got saved. I had, I got hatched. I was born again. And when I got born again, I started associating with those other than in Christ Jesus. So I got imprinted. I, I started taking on the behavior patterns of people that weren't saved. If you are faithful in a church, why are you taking on the behavior pattern of somebody not faithful in church? If I'm a married woman, why would I allow single women to imprint me? I can't you as you marry, if you're married, you can't do what single folk do. So I got to be careful that I don't take on the patterns, the behavior patterns of something that I'm attracted to that I'm really not of. And I think this is our problem. We are so eas eager to be popular on social media and for people to like me and for people to say amen to what I say and for people to want to be a part of what I'm doing that we don't even recognize I'm acting like a dog when I'm a duck. I'm acting like something else that I'm really not. And so I'm here to speak over your life. It is time to break those behavior patterns of anything and anyone that is not in Christ Jesus. If, if I'm married, I need to have the behavior pattern of a married person. If I'm a mother, I need to have the behavior pattern of a mother. If I'm in church, I need to have the behavior pattern of being in church. If I'm in school, I need to have the behavior pattern of being in school. And so I'm speaking over our lives right now as I close this Bible study, the first one of 2021. Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus, change my behavior pattern so that it is evident in every area of my life. Watch this, that I'm in Christ Jesus. And so I'm going to spend some more time. I've got two more things out of these first six verses. If this blessed you, type it, bless me. Share it with somebody else. I want you to, I want to settle the struggle with my identity. I had one big point today, and that one big point was recognize my righteousness. Recognize who I am in Christ. Everybody say, I'm in Christ. And because I'm in Christ, there must be evidence of salvation and evidence of service.
So Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus, help us to have the right concept of who we are. Thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe, either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.